Hi, I'm Martin Swetman, and in this video I'm going to continue my review of the Younger Dryas Impact Abate research. So far we've covered the published research from the original Firestone et al paper in 2007 through to the end of 2016 in the last video. And we saw in the last video that the evidence in favour of the Younger Dryas Impact Theory is overwhelming, especially diagnostic geochemical evidence dating to the onset of the Younger Dryas period in terms of rare platinum group metals, impact spherules and nano diamonds uh, has been found at the base of the Younger Dryas black mat on three continents, so that's North America, Europe and Western Asia. And this evidence times very well with a clear platinum spike in Greenland that occurs simultaneously, as far as we can tell, with the onset of dramatic cooling. Now the only evidence so far that casts doubt on the theory is from a so-called blind test study published in 2016, which we reviewed in part 13, in which a nano diamond layer appears to occur at a level in the sediment at Lubbock Lake in Texas, corresponding to after the Younger Dryas period, uh, over a thousand years later than expected. Considering that several other independent research groups consistently find a nano diamond layer at the base of the Younger Dryas black mat at the onset of cooling and not after this cold period ended, this is perplexing. However, it's not clear that the 2016 blind test study really was a blind test since we don't really know who actually took the sediment samples in that test. Uh, but if the blind test is correct then perhaps it indicates that the Younger Dryas Mini Ice Age was also ended by a cosmic impact. At least that's a possibility we shouldn't rule out. So with that in mind let's turn to 2017. So we have quite a few papers in 2017 to review and we'll take them in rough chronological order. Now I won't review the paper by Birchard which claims that deep troughs in the Great Lakes of North America might be ice shielded impact craters of Younger Dryas Age as I'm not a geologist and therefore not in a position to comment on that work. Uh, and this paper the second paper by Dalton and Amari is more or less just a restatement of the conclusions of their preceding paper. So in this video I'll only review their initial paper which also refers to this other paper by Scott uh, Hardiman et al. Uh, and I'll also review this paper by Moore et al. So we'll start with this first paper by Dalton and Amari et al. Now, this is an extensive review of all the nano diamond evidence presented so far. And remember, we've seen that the nano diamond evidence of the Comet Research Group is confirmed by many other independent research groups who have also found nano diamond abundances at the onset of the Younger Dryas cooling, including the work of Kerbatov et al. from Greenland, uh, Tian et al. Uh, from the site at Lommel in Belgium. Uh, Van Hussel et al. from a site in the Netherlands and Bement et al. from a site in Oklahoma. Now Dalton and colleagues, the co-authors here, have been some of the theory's harshest critics and this work is no exception but they clearly have their work cut out if they're going to refute the work of five other research groups. Now this is an, an important paper because it illustrates how the scientific process works and because it's a very detailed and robustly argued attack on seemingly insurmountable nano diamond evidence. So let's see how these authors approach this task. So what I'll do is summarize each section of this paper in turn showing where the fatal flaws in its arguments lie. Now the main contention of this paper, which we can see from the abstract, is that the Lonsdale-like form of nano diamond, which is generally thought to correspond to nano diamonds formed under especially extreme shock conditions, has been misidentified by other research groups. But this is not actually important for the impact hypothesis, as any form of nano diamond requires fairly extreme conditions anyway. So in my view, the focus on Lonsdaleite is a red herring. 
Again, it's a kind of hangover from the old-fashioned science of asteroid impacts. And because asteroids are typically hard and dense, they can more easily create impact craters and shocked minerals formed under highly extreme conditions. Comet fragments, on the other hand, on which the Younger Dryas impact theory are based, are more fragile and need to be much larger before an impact crater is formed. So for the Younger Dryas impact, any kind of nano diamond will do. But their abstract actually goes further and claims there is no evidence of a spike of any kind of nano diamond at the Younger Dryas boundary at all. So I'm going to focus on this claim, ignoring their specific claims about Lonsdaleite, which are largely irrelevant. So we start with their introduction, which, as I scroll through, you'll see is very overlong. So this is a single issue paper about the existence of nano diamonds at the base of the Younger dry black, Dryas Black Mat. So there is no need to uh, write a comprehensive review of papers that are not directly relevant to it in this lengthy preamble. Indeed, they even refer to an old book by Allen and Delaire from 1997 called Cataclysm, which precedes the 2007 Firestone paper by 10 years and which discusses some bizarre non-physical claims such as crustal displacement theory and pole shifts. Now, although there is a lot to commend in that book, it really doesn't belong in this introduction. But it's clear why the authors of this work do this. It's because they are intent on throwing everything they can find to discredit the Younger Dryas impact theory at it. But actually all this achieves is to make their position look weak. It suggests they don't have much confidence in their own scientific evidence and are getting a bit desperate. In any case, having reviewed the whole scientific literature since the 2007 Firestone paper in detail, it's also clear that their introduction is very biased and unnecessary. And those who peer-reviewed this paper should really have asked for it to be shortened. In fact, given its bias, it's interesting to look at who these authors are, because like everything else, science is a human story involving personalities and vested interests. Now, Tyrone Dalton is a material scientist and he's an expert in nano diamond analysis and formation in space environments. So Chico Amari is a space scientist and she is expert in the recovery and analysis of space dust from comets and asteroids. Now Andrew Scott, Mark Hardiman and Scott Anderson are paleobotanists and paleogeographers and they each have a special interest in how fire correlates to massive climate change in ancient times. And Nick Pinter is um, a hydrogeologist with a special interest in flooding and how rivers shape the landscape. So what we have here is one group of scientists who are specialized specialists in analyzing nanodiamonds from space and another whose core research concerning the correlation between plants, fire, flooding, climate change and the environment is severely challenged by this impact theory. So presumably there's a lot at stake for these guys. Okay, so let's move on to the meat of this paper. The next section concerns their experimental method for finding, isolating, detecting and counting nano diamonds in soil samples. Now we know this group involving Dalton, Pinter and Scott have previously published on this subject. Remember they published this paper in 2010 that couldn't find nano diamonds in sediments from Arlington Canyon where the Comet Research Group found them and we saw that probably this was because they looked in the wrong place or in the wrong type of carbon particle, charcoal, instead of carbon spherules, elongates or glassy carbon, where other research groups have found the nano diamonds. Well, guess what? Where do you think they go this time to find the nano diamonds? Remember, nano diamonds have been found at over a dozen well dated sites by five independent research groups, so they have a lot of choice. But no, instead, they head back to Arlington Canyon again. But it's really not the best area for looking for these nano diamonds. There are plenty of sites where their job would have been much easier. 
However, probably they were stung by the criticism which met their earlier 2010 paper and decided to have another go to pr prove that they were right. Nevertheless, given that earlier work from 2010, we need to pay special attention to where they obtain their samples in this paper. So let's see what they do. Actually, they obtain two samples, one from Arlington Canyon at a location previously visited, they say, by the Comet Research Group, and one from Lommel in Belgium, where Tian et al. found nanodiamonds in the Younger Dryas Black Mat back in 2010. And we reviewed that paper in Tian et al. in video three. Now the sample from Lommel in Belgium is provided by Philip Claes, who co-authored the Tian paper. So there should be no problem with that sample. And according to Claes, it's the same sample they used in their work. And it spans the black mat, black mat at that site, including some sediment from just below and some from just above the thin black layer itself. But what about the sample they obtained from Arlington Canyon? Can we be sure they sampled directly from the layers documented by the Comet Research Group? Well, let's see. Now, quite annoyingly, here they say that details of the sample, which they call SRA09-28A, are in two different papers. So we'll need to go and look at them. Now the 2016 paper they cite is, is actually in our impact bibliography later in 2017. So we can look at that first. However, they also cite this uh, 2010 paper by Scott that we haven't previously reviewed, but we better check out that paper too. So here is their 2016 stroke 17 paper. Uh, and remember, we need to look for a sample labelled SRA0928A. Now we can see from this photo that they took many samples uh, from this site at Arlington Canyon. They're all labelled here, but none of them correspond to SRA0928A, which is odd because this is definitely the paper they cited. However, they also say up here that uh, details of the samples are contained in the supplementary information. So we'd better look in there too. Actually, this is really annoying. Why, why can't they just be upfront and clear about their, where, where their samples are coming from in the main part of the original paper, considering it's such a, a crucial point. Anyway, here is the supplementary part of this other paper. And now we can compare the details of this site with that of the Comet Research Group, who found the nano diamonds here. And we can see from these photographs, these are from Dalton et al. And this one is from the Comet Research Group, that these really, this really is the same site. It's the same bank of sediment at Arlington Canyon. However, the Comet Research Group claim that this bank is five meters high. And therefore, because there are only four meters above the surface, they must have dug down about a meter below the surface for the, fine, for the last meter of their samples. On the other hand, uh, Dalton et al. only have uh, four meters at most of sediment from which they take the samples. Despite this difference, they do confirm that the whole sediment sequence in this four meter section has the same radiocarbon date within uh, the uncertainty of the experimental method. Now how this four or five meter bank can form so quickly is not exactly clear, but presumably it means that this valley filled with sediment shortly after the Younger Dryas event, uh, perhaps there were severe storms directly after the, uh, after the event, uh, a reasonable assumption, uh, and perhaps that they washed this sediment down into the valley, and that might explain why there is more than one black mat layer here. As you can see, uh, the Comet Research Group claim there are two layers or horizons in this sediment where uh, the impact proxies are found, one at around four meters and another one right at the bottom at the five meter level. In any case, this discrepancy in the height of the bank doesn't matter because even in this supplementary information, there isn't a sample labeled 
SRA0928A. Oh dear, this is getting really annoying. It means that we'll have to go back to the 2010 work to find where that sample came from. Okay, so here is their earlier 2010 paper. So let's look again for details of the sample SRA0928A. Well, unfortunately, from this photo, it's not clear uh, that they're even at the same site anymore. These banks don't look to be the same as in the other photos. And there are no details of sample SRA0928A anywhere in this paper either. So where is this mysterious sample recorded? Does it even exist? Well, a bit more searching, and it seems that this paper is a wrong citation. Instead, it appears that they should have cited their paper from 2010 that we already reviewed. The paper that previously failed to find nano diamonds. Oh dear, this isn't looking good, is it? And here we now have sample SRA0928, presumably 298 presumably 28A. But unfortunately we still don't know if this is the same site. Presumably it is because they talk about a five meter sequence of sediment from which they take the samples. But now they say that the radiocarbon dating of this sediment sequence spans over 5,000 years which is completely different to before. So really we can't be sure this is the same site. I mean, so this is just getting a bit ridiculous. Now, previously in an earlier video, when we reviewed this paper, we rejected this sample because they only analyzed some charred wood and nano diamonds have never been found in charcoal or wood particles. The problem for us now is that all they say about their sample is that, it is, that it is that it is somewhere from the lowest meter of this five meter section. So not are we not sure where this bank is in Arlington Canyon. It seems to have different dating and they took a sample from somewhere in the lowest meter of sediment. So once again, it really isn't clear that they took this sample from the two thin black sections carefully highlighted, carefully highlighted by the Comet Research Group. So this is another disaster by this group. You'd have thought they would have learned from their earlier mistake and made sure they accurately documented the location of their sample this time, but they haven't. So, you know, to me, this looks to be beyond incompetence. This almost looks to be deliberate. And of course, going back to the original paper, they don't find any nano diamonds in their sample. Well, what a surprise. Clearly, we can ignore that result. So we have to move on instead to the sample that was given to them by Philip Claes, from the Lommel site in Belgium. Now this time they must find nano diamonds in this sample, right? Because it's the same sample of sediment used before by Tian et al. And just to be clear, here are the results of Tian et al. And we can see from their results, they unequivocally find nano diamonds in this sample. So here they say our findings confirm and in fact reveal more direct proof than earlier studies of the existence of nano diamond particles in this layer. No such particles are found in the overlying silt and clay or in the underlying fine sands. And here they say they have indisputable signals of nano diamond from two different techniques. One from a, a, one particular kind of electron diffraction and a, a second from a different kind of technique called ELNES. So what did Dalton et al. find in this same sample? Nothing, as we can see here. No diamonds, no nano diamonds at all. Why is this? We can't know. However, they do say that they don't perform an exhaustive search. Now, given that this sample of sediment includes earth from both above and below the black mat at Lommel, that might be an explanation for the negative result. And they also say that Van Hussel et al were unable to find nano diamonds at Lommel, but the work they cite, Van Hussel 2014, is her PhD thesis. And curiously, this evidence from her thesis has never found its way into any peer reviewed journal paper, suggesting she doesn't think it would stand up under the harsh, harsh scrutiny of peer review. And of course, the evidence from Tian is clear. Nano diamonds clearly exist in the Younger Dryas black mat at Lommel, but not above or below. Now, to be fair to Dalton et al, they don't make too much of this result. 
presumably because the evidence from Tian et al. is so clear. So let's move on. Now in the next section of their paper, Dalton et al. Uh, review the literature on the Younger Dras nano diamond evidence. And they say that if a, a nano diamond layer is confirmed, it would suggest that a unique event occurred at this time the layer was deposited. Now this is good because it means that they agree that a widely synchronous layer of nano diamonds is strong evidence for an unusual event and cannot be explained simply in terms of wildfires, for example, as other authors have suggested. Now they break the evidence down into several categories and review the evidence for Lon's Daylight first. But we're not concerned with this, so let's move on to the next section concerning regular cubic diamond. Now in this section they helpfully provide a lengthy review of how cubic uh, diamond or nano diamonds can be produced within Earth's crust at high temperatures and extreme pressures. But the text only starts to get interesting at around here, where they say that nano diamonds were observed in modern soils in Germany, and this is in a paper by Yang et al. from 2008. And clearly they're citing this as counter evidence for the impact hypothesis. But of course it isn't, uh, because just as at Bull Creek, this is the work of Bemen et al., uh, this modern layer of nano diamonds could easily have resulted from a relatively modern comet impact, similar to the Kunguska event, for instance. In fact, Yang et al. actually suggests that possibility in their paper. And then Dalton et al. repeat the nonsense of other critics that the nano diamonds found by von Husserl et al. in the Ursula horizon in Netherlands post-date the Younger Dryas event by several hundred years. But as we know, and we reviewed that paper in an earlier video, the conclusions of Van Hussel et al. don't stand up to scrutiny. Their radiocarbon data for this site is completely consistent with the onset of the Younger Dryas cooling. And actually it's statements like this that trouble me in this work because any serious scientist can easily see this for themselves by looking critically at Van Hussel et al.'s data. So once again, I'm getting the impression that these guys are desperate to reach a predetermined conclusion. Ultimately, their conclusion from this section is that the presence of cubic nano diamonds in sediments cannot be used as an impact marker because shock metamorphism does not appear to be the predominant formation mechanism of diamonds of that size found in the crust. Okay, that's a little bit complicated. What are they saying? What, are they, what they're saying here is that because nano diamonds and diamonds are also found deep in Earth's crust, they cannot be used as a diagnostic for a cosmic impact. Now that might be true for nano diamonds found in sediments associated with a volcanic explosion, but all the work involving nano diamonds at the Younger Dryas boundary has ruled out volcanism. And in any case, there is a synchronous layer of nano diamonds across three continents, and no recent volcanic event has been large enough to have created that. So this statement makes no sense. Actually, they seem to be making perhaps a broader statement than that. It seems they are also implying that because, according to their view, nano diamonds found deep in Earth's crust are not produced by a shock mechanism, that those on Earth's surface cannot be produced by the shock of a cosmic impact. Now, if this is what they mean, and it's not clear it is, then it's not logical either. Because in both cases, that is deep in Earth's crust and via a cosmic impact, the necessary conditions exist for, da for diamond nucleation, i.e. high temperature and extreme pressure. So whatever, their conclusion here is not supportable. They then go on to discuss other reported forms of nano diamond, uh, like N diamond, and again, they say that the presence of N diamonds in sediments cannot be used as an impact marker because they are also reported in sediments that do not date to the Younger Dryas boundary. So they're repeating their argument that the work of Yang et al. and Bemant et al. who find modern layers of these kinds of nano diamonds, and they're saying that this contradicts the Younger Dryas impact theory. But as we've already seen, this is not logically true, as these layers could also have been produced by more recent local impacts. Now the rest of their discussion here concerns the Carolina Bays, which doesn't concern us. Now their next section, discusses the kinds of carbon particle in which nano diamonds are found. 
Uh, but this is really inconsequential for us. All we are interested in is whether the nanodiamonds exist at the Younger Dryas boundary. So we can skip through this. Now we come to their main argument in the paper. This is how they actually try to refute the Younger Dryas boundary nanodiamond evidence as they indicated in their abstract. Essentially, they're admitting here that nanodiamonds have been found at the base of the Younger Dryas black mat. But what they're saying is that the methods used to count these nanodiamonds are flawed, and therefore that no abundance peak at the base of the black mat can be reliably reported. Now, this is an interesting idea. You see, typically researchers will use different experimental methods to confirm the presence of nanodiamonds to those used to actually count how many nanodiamonds there are. And this is because the kinds of electron microscopy used to measure the diffraction patterns that confirm the presence of nanodiamond are very laborious and expensive. And they're not suited to counting the large number of nanodiamonds in a larger sample. On the other hand, the cheaper kinds of microscopy used to count nanodiamonds in large samples don't actually detect nanodiamonds unequivocally. They instead detect the shape of particles, which might or might not actually be nanodiamonds or contain nanodiamonds. So when researchers try to count nanodiamonds, what they actually do is count the number of particles with a specific shape and then assume that a certain proportion of those actually contain nanodiamonds. Now this is fine provided a check on a small sample has been performed with the more expensive microscopy to confirm what this proportion is. And presumably, being good scientists, all the researchers who measured nanodiamond abundances would have done this. It's standard practice to check or calibrate any counting method like this. But Dalton et al. suggest this is not the case, that they haven't performed this calibration. Now this is perhaps a worry, because it means that the magnitude of the abundances or the spikes of, in nanodiamonds that various researchers have reported are not that reliable they could have a lot of error or uncertainty. However, this is not really an important point because we're not really interested in this magnitude. For example, we don't really care whether there are, say, 40 nanodiamonds per gram in a sample or 80 nanodiamonds per gram. All we really want to know is whether there is an abundant spike. In other words, are there a lot of nanodiamonds at the base of the black mat, but none above? or below. So in this sense, the measurement of the Comet Research Group and others are fine. You see, we've had many independent research groups find this nanodiamond abundance at the base of the black mat. The chance that these are just random signals, noise if you like, as Dalton et al. are suggesting, is negligible. These spikes exist, even if we can't quantify them very accurately. However, Dalton then goes on to say that the only reliable way to measure the nanodiamond abundance is to use a new method that he has specifically developed. Ah, now we can see why he's making all this fuss. Now we can see what is driving Dalton in this debate. What we have is one nanodiamond expert, Dalton, who's developed a new nanodiamond counting technique trying to convince other experts like the Comet Research Group, that they should be using his method for counting nan nanodiamonds. But the other groups aren't interested in his new method because they don't really care precisely what the magnitudes are. They just want to measure a spike in abundance of any magnitude. It's all relative as far as they're concerned. So it seems to me this is really an argument about measurement technique. And this is very common in science. It's one of the main things we do in science is continually develop better, more accurate counting techniques. It's something I do myself in my own research concerning the measurement of something called free energy. It's the same for Dalton. He wants everyone to suddenly switch to using his nano diamond counting technique. The problem is his determination to do this is getting in the way of an important scientific debate. Okay, now we understand why Dalton is so fussy about nano diamond abundances. Let's move on to the next section. So this one discusses whether the nanodiamonds are generated from cosmic or terrestrial carbon, which does not really concern us. So we can move on to the next section concerning the synchronicity of the Younger Dryas boundary layer on three continents. And of course, Dalton et al. base their argument against this synchronicity on the papers by Meltzer and Holliday from 2014. But we've already reviewed those papers and we know they make schoolboy errors regarding uncertainties in the data. And we also know that Kenneth et al. 
in 2015 showed using the gold standard method of Bayesian statistics that the geochemical evidence for the Younger Dryas boundary is consistent with a synchronous event with an uncertainty overall of about 50 years. And that's really pretty good. In fact, if we go to their paper from 2015, we can see from this table that there are six sites, each with an uncertainty of less than 100 years in this list here. Another five sites with an uncertainty in their age of less than 200 years and two more with an uncertainty of less than 300 years and so on. Now in their work from 2014 Meltzer and Holiday claimed that only three sites are well dated. Let's just have a look. So essentially they claim, this is Meltzer and Holiday, that only Big Eddy, Daisy Cave and Sheridan Cave are well dated. But let's just remember, let's just look again into this claim that only three sites are well dated because this evidence is being used consistently by critics of the impact theory and it's important to nail this one on the head. So let's just cross-reference this paper by Meltzer and Holiday from 2014 with the one by the Comet Research Group from 2015. And the first site that we come to where there is a dispute is Abu Huraira. So here in Kenneth et al's 2015 paper it's given a date of 12,825 BP, where BP means before 1950 AD. So that's 10,875 BC to within 55 years at, at the level of what's called one sigma in the uncertainty, or in other words, 110 years at the level of 95% confidence. So this is perfectly consistent with the proposed age of the Younger Dryas event and the onset of Younger Dryas cooling uh, and the platinum event in Greenland. But Meltzer and Holiday from 2014, they reject this Abu Huraira site because they identify many problems with the age depth model, which they detail in their discussion here and below. Now this is fine, it's okay to point out these problems, but what really matters is what result they obtain from their own age depth analysis of the Abu Huraira site. And the problem is we don't really know the answer to this because they don't have a go at it. Instead, what they do is repeat the analysis of the Comet Research Group using the exact same data points, even the ones they disagreed with using. And here it is in the uh, supplementary information to their paper. So here are their best fit lines to the radiocarbon data used by the Comet Research Group to create their age depth model at Abu Huraira. And remember their conclusion is that according to these best fit lines, the burned layer at Abu Huraira falls outside the proposed age of the Younger Dryas event. But remember, and we reviewed this paper in an earlier video, they forgot to include the uncertainty in these best fit lines. In other words, the slope and the height of these lines are uncertain. And even by eye, it's obvious that there is sufficient uncertainty in these fits to encompass the proposed Younger Dryas event date. So they really shouldn't have rejected Abu Huraira. And they make the same mistake for all the other sites they look at. They forget to include the uncertainty in their best fit lines. So their conclusions are not supported. And yet, when we go back to the paper by Dalton et al, they ignore this error in their analysis. They're happy to perpetuate the claims that the Younger Dryas boundary at these different sites is not synchronous. And again, this is poor science. They just needed to look more carefully at the details of the data analysis. Okay, so let's move on from this. Well, actually, that's more or less it. We next come to the conclusions in this paper by Dalton et al. Now their first conclusion concerns Lons daylight, which doesn't concern us. They next turn to the cubic nanodiamond evidence, and their main conclusion here is essentially that cubic nanodiamonds cannot be used as an impact proxy because no younger Dryas event crater has been found. Okay, so that's the old-fashioned argument that a crater is required, and we know it isn't, as the proposed model of the Younger Dryas impact concerns a swarm of comet fragments, and it's not known if any of them were large enough to create a crater. 
and they also refer to the synchronicity problem which we've just debunked. They use practically the same argument in their third conclusion against the other nanodiamond forms like n-diamond, with the added criticism that their diffraction patterns can be easily confused with copper nanocrystals. But if you go back through their paper, go back through this paper, to find the evidence they cite on this issue, you find it comes only from analysis of the sediments at Arlington Canyon, where they didn't find any nanodiamonds, but they did apparently find copper nanocrystals. But remember, it's not clear they actually sampled the Younger Dryas boundary at Arlington Canyon. So, so how secure is their conclusion here? It's not clear to me that they can really substantiate this, given they didn't have any N-form nanodiamonds to compare with their copper nanocrystals. And their final conclusion regards the measurement of nanodiamond abundances. And as we saw, while there might be some uncertainty in the magnitude of these nanodiamond spikes, their present is not re presence is not really in doubt. I suspect this is really more about Dalton trying to impose his new nanodiamond counting technique on other scientists. So there we have it. Overall, a weak paper. It tried to take on the seemingly insurmountable nanodiamond evidence and largely fails. The most interesting thing it reveals is that we should take the magnitude of these nanodiamond abundances with a pinch of salt because they're highly uncertain. But the presence of these nanodiamond abundances or the spikes at the Younger Dryas boundary seem to be very secure because they've been measured many times at many sites by several different research groups. And there is a possible issue with clearly identifying the N form of nanodiamond how clearly can it be distinguished from tiny copper nanocrystals? And researchers will need to be very careful about this. All right, that was a big effort. Now let's move on to a much easier paper, uh, but that nevertheless is, is crucial in this debate. Now, since the 2000 work of Pete Avatar that discovered a massive platinum spike in Greenland, times perfectly to the onset of the Younger Dryas cooling, we have been waiting for similar platinum ab abundances to be confirmed, or otherwise, at the Younger Dryas boundary, at all the other sites that we know about. Because if isolated platinum peaks are found there too, then it indisputably links the cosmic impact recorded in the Greenland ice with the black mats seen across three continents. While well, the wait is over, in this paper by Moore et al, platinum abundances are confirmed at several of the Younger Dryas sites we are familiar with, and and a few more that are new to us. And so these are the four main sites that they looked at. Uh, so here we have the depth in the sediment at the site, along with the uh, platinum count, that's parts per billion in the sediment. And as you can see at each of these four sites, there is a strong platinum spike that times very well indeed to the suggested date of the Younger Dryas impact event. And we can see how it correlates with um, the other geochemical uh, proxies for the impact, impact. So we have the, the spherules and the nanodiamonds. The spherules and the nanodiamonds at each of these sites. And here is the additional data for the other sites that are new to us, all in the, uh, on the North American continent. And again, we see clear peaks in the platinum abundance at the Younger Dryas boundary layer. Now this is really nice because this kind of elemental abundance, this platinum spike, is relatively easy to measure. There's none of the problems you get with identifying spherules or nano diamonds or isolating magnetic grains. You just take your sediment, put it in the mass spectrometer and look at the readout. And the only reasonable explanation for the platinum anomaly is a cosmic impact. All the other possible sources are ruled out. So if there was any remaining doubt about the impact theory, this dispels it completely. Just like the dinosaur ending asteroids 66 million years ago, for which an iridium anomaly has been detected in sediments across Earth, Earth's surface, we now have a widespread platinum anomaly confirming the Younger Dryas impact theory. Okay. So that's it for the first half of 2017. We had a weak paper from Dalton et al. that largely failed to topple the nano diamond evidence, although it did have a few points of interest. And a crucial paper from Moore et al. that shows the impact theory is correct beyond any reasonable doubt. 
and that the nano diamonds and impex ferals have very likely been correctly identified as impact proxies. Uh, so we'll look at the other papers from 2017 in the next video. If you enjoyed this, then please take a look at my book and my blog.